What's up everybody, Matt Moran here for another weekly update. So there's lots of exciting news to go over here this week. But before I get into this week's news, I first wanna thank Factor for sponsoring this video. Factor delivers fresh, never frozen, dietitian approved meals right to your doorstep. They have over 34 kinds of delicious restaurant quality options that are all ready in just two minutes. They sent me a bunch of different meals to try, including a black pepper and sage pork chop with smoked cheddar Brussels sprouts and creamy broccoli, a cheesy chicken and bacon one with marinated porbello mushrooms and a cheesy jalapeno chicken with cauliflower rice. They were all delicious and filling, especially when paired with the coconut milk smoothies they sent that are also available and also delicious. Beyond the tastiness though, the convenience and savings are great as well. It's faster and less expensive than takeout, so if you're someone that's always busy like I am, having a meal this good, this fast, while saving money almost feels like I found a cheat code to life or something. And if you want to get really fancy, they even offer gourmet plus meals with things like filet mignon on, shrimp, salmon, uh, there's even vegan and veggie options if that's your thing. Factor's team of gourmet chefs create each meal using only ingredients with integrity to help you feel your best all day long and reach your nutrition goals. So if you're ready to eat well and save time and money, head to factor75.com or click the link below and use code MATTMORAN50 to get 50% off your first Factor box. And I also wanted to mention that I will be doing my usual weekly live stream here on Sunday at 12.30 p.m. Eastern time. So join if you can. We always just hang out, talk cars, and answer all your questions. So join if you can. But anyway, getting into the news here this week. Uh, the first interesting thing. So we've been hearing some rumors about the new S2000. And this is something I talked about back in May. And now we have some new rumors thanks to Car Magazine. And these seem to have a little bit of credibility to them. Uh, we will see. But um, Car Magazine in the UK claims to have new info about an S2000 successor uh, that was just hinted at a couple of months ago by a Honda executive who previously back in May said, stay tuned. This is the 75th anniversary of Honda. At the 50th anniversary, we did the S2000. So stay tuned for what's coming later this year and kind of hinted at some type of sports car coming. Now, Honda previously did tease two things under under uh, shadowy covers there. Um, one, most likely an NSX, and then the other one could be this new Honda sports car. So this week's new info uh, comes thanks to industry insiders at the company, um, which claimed that ha the, this new Honda sports car is still arriving this year for the company's 75th anniversary, and it'll still be a fully electric uh, sports car reportedly using the new E uh, architecture that Honda plans to use for over 30 new EVs globally by 2030. And so uh, the first production vehicle we've seen so far on this platform is the ENY1, which is probably the actual worst name for a car currently. <laughs> anyway, that debuted back in May. That's an international thing we don't get here in the States, uh, but that's essentially an electric version of the European HRV. Um, and that one only does 201 horsepower with a single front motor. So we will see what they do with this new S2000, if they do dual motors of that same motor for 400 horsepower, or if they do a single motor in the rear, do 200 horsepower and make like an electric BRZ competitor or something else entirely. But whatever it is, it's not going to be cheap, unfortunately. Um, because the head of automobiles for Honda UK told Car Magazine that while we cannot compete with Chinese manufacturers on price, we have 75 years of engineering experience. So that seems to be hinting at the MG Cyberster um, that is going to be available in the UK and just made some waves over there a few months back. And so, um, you know, that's supposedly having a starting price of around $68,000. So if that's what Honda is alluding to here and they're saying, well, we can't beat them on price, but it'll be better to drive. That means we're looking at a 70 grand car, at least in the UK at the current conversion rates. Now, oftentimes it's not a straight conversion and things do come in cheaper here. If we even get this at all, this could also just be something for international audiences. Since it's electric, I would assume that they would wanna also debut it here, but uh, I have no clue. We That's not a guarantee. So we will see what ends up happening with this thing, but just be prepared. I talked about this in one of my live streams as well. Someone asked if a new S2000 came, how much I think it would cost. And I said, you know, maybe 60, 65 at best. And turns out, you know, it's might even be a little more at 70 uh, to start. So we will see, hopefully at 70 grand, they have some real impressive performance because 200 or even 400 horsepower is probably not going to cut it if you're talking 70 grand. But we will see how this plays out. Uh, assuming again, this actually comes and it's not just a concept or something, you know, that's super limited production. And, you know, if it's actually a normal production model, um, you know, it'll be interesting to see how they price it. But anyway, thankfully, you know, their 75th anniversary is going to be ending here by the end of this year. So they only have, you know, another less than, you know, five or four months here to come out with something. So we'll hopefully have answers sooner rather than later. And so stay tuned for that. But very interesting to get a little bit more info there from Car Magazine. 
Kia this week has just shown off three pictures of the refreshed 2024 Kia Sorento. And as you can see, the front end is completely changed with new headlights that are heavily inspired by the EV9 and the Telluride. And the whole front end is a little boxier now. And I just have to say, it's impressive how Hyundai and Kia do refreshes super fast and they go with what works. And they're like, hey, everyone loves the Telluride. Let's make it look more like a Telluride. <laughs> and there's nothing that's really off limits for them. Um, and I'm just impressed by the boldness here. But anyway, the back end changes are a little more subtle, just some slight tweaks there to the taillights and the rear bumper. The interior gets a big change uh, to better match uh, the new Sportage with a pair of curved 12.3 inch screens and a totally new dashboard design there. There's also a new center console and some ambient lighting there that, you know, similar to other Kias as well. Powertrains will most likely be carryovers you know, that's what they've been doing with all these other refreshes. As far as when these are going to be arriving um, and when we'll get more details, uh, Korea is going to be getting this first in August. So expect more concrete stuff and more images very, very soon. And then, um, you know, obviously they get all their stuff way earlier than we do. So, you know, after it's made its debut in Korea, hopefully we'll have some more info here towards the end of this year. But the Kia website doesn't show a 2024 Sorento, and I would assume that they would want to get that up sooner rather than later. Um, so I'm assuming if this is the 2024, that they're going to try and rush this out fairly quickly to have it ready, I'm guessing, by the fall, especially if it's going to be already in production, you know, by August in Korea. So we'll see. Uh, so stay tuned for that one. But interesting to get that first little preview there. Um, one SUV that we do know the reveal date for now is the 2024 Toyota Land Cruiser. So the full reveal is going to be happening on August 1st at a 9.20 p.m. Eastern time. And I can reveal now that I will actually be at the reveal. I am going to that. And so I will have an in-depth look at the new Land Cruiser for you there. Hopefully we'll have all the details details as well to share on it, or at least, you know, as many as we can expect, you know, for something that probably won't be arriving, I'm guessing until uh, sometime early next year, like the GX, we'll have to see. I don't have any info on that yet, but um, so anyway, to go along with that reveal date announcement, uh, they also provided us a new look at it here, and it's a pretty clear look. I mean, we can see a pretty good shot of the front end there. Um, you know, it's very easy to imagine how that's going to look now, at least in the front, and obviously you can see the clear inspiration, you know, from the 80s there, and I think it's going to be a really cool look. Again, that and the side silhouette that we already have, I think this will be a huge hit for Toyota as long as it's priced well. We will see. But anyway, pretty cool looking so far, and stay tuned for that re reveal video here next week. There's also a few special editions that debuted here this week. So first off, also paying homage to the 80s, Volkswagen has revealed the Jetta GLI 40th Anniversary Edition for the 2024 model year. So this one's just an appearance package that gives you black wheels and black accents on the outside, including even the door handles, um, which is an impressive commitment and you know, it does give it a little bit of a old school vibe with the black door handles there. You also get uh, GLI 40 badges um, outside and inside. Inside it also gets unique cloth seats with a stitch pattern that'll be different on every car they say and kind of be like a fingerprint. Um, and you know, while that's interesting, uh, I feel like for an homage to the 80s, they should have just done the plaid interior from the GTI why it almost irks me that this thing looks actually a little bit retro on the outside and yet the inside is not retro like ah, plaid seats easy choice there volkswagen i don't know what this other thing's about but anyway uh <laughs> beyond that here um you can see there's a uh, various 40 badges on the interior as well it'll be available in white gray or blue and thankfully it's still available with either the dsg or the six-speed manual and while it still has the lsd the adaptive dampers and the upgraded brakes like the autobahn this edition appears to be kind of reintroducing that base model that was dropped a few years back for the GLI because the past couple of years here it's only been the Audubon version so it appears like this one you know, doesn't have cooled seats for example there's only buttons there for the heated seats and the cloth of course also downgrades it compared to an Audubon and uh, so it's actually coming in thankfully under the price of the Audubon so this special edition version is going to be starting at just $29,235 including destination so getting the GLI back under 30 it's great to see uh, that's compared to the $32,680 for the 2023 Audubon and that price may also go up, you know, for 2024 here just due to inflation. So we'll see. Um, and only uh, 1,984 of these will be made, uh, paying homage to, again, the first model year in 1984 there. Um, and these will be arriving before the end of the summer. So basically any day now, these should start arriving. And so anyway, really cool to see that. See a special edition that's cheaper, reintroduces a base trim, and still gives you something really cool. So I think that's great. Uh, just swap in some plaid seats. <laughs> but anyway, moving on here, Ford is throwing it even further back with their special edition here. Uh, which is the 2024 Bronco Sport Freewheeling Special Edition with the very bold 70s graphics on the side, hood, 
and even on the seats on the inside, along with red accents there in the wheels. It's based on the Big Ben trim, and they'll start at $35,325, including destination. And of course, it's just the exterior stuff and the interior stuff. There isn't any mechanical or substantial changes, but a very bold choice once again to have those huge graphics there on the side. And, um, you know, we'll see how it sells, but uh, very cool to see that. And during Chevy's quarterly earnings call here this past week, CEO Mary Barra uh, announced that the next generation Bolt is coming, which is something that was hinted at a couple of months back in an interview, um, but actually firm, firm commitment here now. Um, they will continue to offer it and it'll continue to offer great affordability, range and technology. And she said that with the Bolt's recent uh, hot streak here, selling over 33,000 so far this year, which is really big numbers for an EV. Um, that's more than the Blazer, the Colorado, the Suburban and the Trax so far this year as well, which I mean, so this is like really well. I think, you know, obviously the tax credits really helped it a lot and just showed that with the right pricing, people will dive headfirst into bolts and other EVs, you know, it's just the pricing. And um, anyway, so Chevy says they want to keep the momentum going and added that we will execute this new version more quickly compared to an all new program. Typically, you know, would be with significantly lower engineering expense and capital investment by updating the vehicle with Altium and Altify technologies and by applying our winning with simplicity discipline. And while they said that timing and specific details will be announced at a later date, they did say they'll bring it back uh, to the market here on an accelerated timeline and that it will be quick. Um, so that's great to hear. You know, I don't know where they're going to build this because, you know, the reason why the Bolt's being discontinued abruptly is because they need that plant to build the Silverado EV and a, a couple other things. So, um, you know, I guess hopefully they'll figure out a plant quickly and get this switched over. As far as, you know, how they'll accelerate it, um, you know, I'm assuming it'll get fresh styling, but you know, there might be a lot of carryover as well, which is fine if it's just, you know, the same package that clearly everyone loves currently, just with faster charging with the Ultium platform, better range, better performance. Um, you know, seems like a great improvement. And so uh, it's also great because I believe this will be coming in cheaper than the Equinox EV starting at, you know, that starts at 30 grand. So this could be, you know, the sub $30,000 really nice vehicle. I mean, already the Bolt's great as it is, but with faster charging and uh, the Ultium platform and still under that price point will be a, hopefully a hot seller. And like they said, keep that momentum going. So great news there. And hopefully it does come out quick enough that they don't lose too much momentum because there's going to be at least probably a year gap, if not more. So We'll see, but interesting to hear that. And uh, just last week, Mini showed off the uh, interior of the new 2025 Cooper. And this week, they revealed more details about that center infotainment screen that they're calling the Mini Interaction Unit. And it's actually really cool. So first off, it's an OLED screen uh, made by Samsung, which is how it's able to be so thin with hardly any bezel and have graphics that are that crisp. Um, the software is all new and is touch only now, by the way. There's no controllers. It's not iDrive based or anything, thankfully. Um, and the appearance will change depending on which experience mode you're in. And in addition to having their own colors and setups for the info there, uh, they also will have unique sounds from crickets and uh, a few other nature sounds in the balance mode uh, to my favorite, which is the timeless one, which uh, has some sounds that blend a classic mini engine um, with a modern John Cooper Works GP. Um, so have a listen to all these different modes. It's kind of cool. <music> say you can also even upload your own picture as the background and um, the car will be able to figure out um, and that's in this personal mode the car will be able to figure out what colors are in your image and then match your ambient lighting to that instead of you know the ambient lighting matching whatever other drive modes there are there so really cool that you know whatever colors in your picture they'll match it on your ambient lighting i think that's a first in a car so that's pretty cool anyway other stuff here is uh it still does have apple carplay and android auto so don't worry about you know them losing that they still have that integration there if you just want to have that on the screen uh, plus there's a customizable menu bar as well uh, to control things as easily as you want there there's also a new personal assistant uh and uh thankfully it's either a dog named spike or a car called mini um th thankfully there's no weird d from uh, bmw uh, carrying over 
over, which was a strange thing. I think Mini is definitely on the better track here as far as infotainment uh, assistance goes. But anyway, the navigation now will also intelligently route you to different charging stations along your trip if you're planning a longer trip there. Um, and lastly, it also has air console gaming uh, built in there, so you can uh, use your phone to uh, control video games on the screen. Same thing BMW's introduced, and I believe also Mercedes and a couple of others. And so... Uh, you know, cool to have that whenever you're, you know, charging this vehicle up. And uh, speaking of the car, though, uh, the weekly uh, trickle of info here is suggesting we will get a full reveal relatively soon. Um, and uh, so anyway, we've already seen a couple of pictures of it, but um, looking forward to you know learning more about it. And hopefully they keep the price relatively low. And uh, anyway, this thing's shaping up to be really promising in my opinion. And there will also be gas versions of the Cooper still. It's not just gonna be an EV. And by the way, this infotainment system will also carry over to the new Countryman. So I believe this will be basically, probably most minis will be getting this screen eventually. Um, so the Countryman's gonna have it too. So it's not, this all this fun isn't exclusive to the Cooper, which is great. So anyway, I think that's a, one of the better infotainment systems I've seen recently and has a lot of promise. So we'll see how it all works in reality, but great to hear that. Uh, Mercedes has their own teaser here this week showing a shadowy silhouette here of a concept car that they'll be previewing um, for a entry level model that's coming uh, down the road but I believe for now this will just be a concept we'll see how far out it is uh, it looks like the concept car here doesn't have any kind of door handle so that's you know one thing but uh, we'll see you know what they end up doing but we're not sure if this thing's going to be electric gas or both because I believe the platform it's on can accommodate both uh, different types of powertrains so we'll see about that but we don't have too much longer to wait at least for this concept uh, because uh, Mercedes is saying that it'll debut at the Munich Auto Show in September um, I believe it's like the first week of September there and uh, from what we can see so far it looks like a nice evolution here of the CLA but uh, you know we'll have to wait for more info here uh, and uh, just about a month and a half. And Audi this week has revealed uh, partially the new Q6 e-tron along with the sportier S uh, Q6 as well. And so it, it even let a few journalists drive them. And uh, so we have some drive impressions that are early. But uh, basically, you know, as far as all the normal news stuff here, uh, we got a few exterior pictures, uh, but nothing of the interior. So um, the interior is still a mystery, but you know, you can use your imagination. It's not going to be too hard to figure out based on current Audis. But anyway, you can see the design language on the outside here is pretty similar to the Q4 e-tron and some other concepts we've seen from Audi. And this one's going to be on the new PPE platform. And so it's encouraging to see them letting people drive this, which means that hopefully this PPE platform that's been delayed many times is finally getting close to being ready for prime time here. Um, and it's the platform that's going to be shared with the upcoming electric Porsche Macan as well, which I'm assuming they'll do a drive program for that prototype maybe at some point for some people. But um, anyway, this platform is 800 volts. It allows 270 kilowatt charging speeds. Um, and uh, this Q6 in particular has 100 kilowatt hour batteries as standard. And so in America, that'll likely amount to a range of about 325 miles and a 10% to 80% charge in about 30 minutes. They'll all be all wheel drive with dual motors with the regular one doing 396 horsepower in its uh, power boost mode uh, with the S version going up to 510 horsepower in its boost mode, along with a zero to 60 time of under four and a half seconds for that one. They'll also get adaptive air suspensions as standard. And that's about all the info we have so far that they're sharing. Um, but the full reveal will be happening next year, they say, with it arriving uh, as a 2025 model year vehicle, uh, most likely. So anyway, seems really promising. They said it'll be around the same size as the current Q5, just with shorter overhangs and uh, a little bit more interior space. Uh, thanks to, the, again, the packaging of the electric uh, you know, components there. But um, Sounds pretty promising, and so yeah, looking forward to hearing more about that. And we have some more details this week about Aston Martin's future plans, uh, particularly their uh, you know electrification plans for the regular models. So you know, just a few weeks ago, they announced their big partnership with Lucid um, for their future EVs, and they'll be using you know Lucid tech that's going to be wild. Um, but this week we get info about those gas powered models. So first their CEO revealed that the new Vantage and DBS, which by the way, I'm just happy the DBS is making a return. But so Vantage, DBS, uh, those new ones will be rolled out over the next 15 months. Um, and that after that, um, these core models, including the DB12 and the DBX as well, um, will all get plug-in hybrid variants um, to bridge the customer journey from ICE to full BEV starting in 2026, they say. So still have a little ways to go. So, you know, once they get those debuts out of the way, then the plug-in hybrids will start rolling out. And they revealed uh, that they'll be using Mercedes tech for the plug-in hybrid stuff. Um, and so it'll be likely the same tech that they use in the e-performance AMGs that we've been seeing uh, rolling out here recently, which if they keep the same setup means you have tiny batteries with hardly any electric range, um, but lots of power, maxing out at around 800 horsepower and a thousand pound-feet of torque in that S63 e-performance. And, um, 
you know, those are paired with the same kind of twin turbo V8 that uh, Aston Martin uses as well for Mercedes. So the only potential uh, wild card here is if Aston keeps around the twin turbo V12 for the DBS, um, then this plug-in hybrid setup could do even more power than the Mercedes potentially. And they could also tune it to do more as well if they want to try and have some type of upper hand here. We'll see. I don't know how many Aston customers, again, need more than 800 horsepower and 1,000 pound-feet of torque. But, uh, you know, we will see how Aston chooses to package it and um you know we'll see it's it you know it'll be promising i just you know i still wonder how many aston martin fans really want this um and they said you know it's trying to bridge that gap but it seems like a lot of them would just be more excited probably to just go straight to the electric stuff because i mean if you remember a few weeks ago when i was talking about the lucid partnership i mean that thing is going to be wild i'm more excited about that they're talking about quad motor evs with like 1500 horsepower which will be just nuts. And so <laughs> I think, you know, if you're going for a wow factor, I think no one's going to have any problem jumping straight from gas to the EVs. These plug-in hybrids might be a little lukewarm with their reception. We'll see. Maybe uh, people will love them. I don't know. But anyway, that's the plan from Aston Martin here. And so interesting to hear that. Inside EVs this week discovered a new Lexus trademark uh, application in Europe for the TZ name, um, which will likely be used on a larger three-row SUV um, that's already been teased. Um, pretty clearly, you know, it looks pretty production ready there with you know, Lexus and Toyota, you know, kind of laying all their cards on the table there and showing all these concepts, you know, last year. And so, um, Toyota will be getting a version, of course, as well that I believe was in the concept was called the BZ5X. So we'll see. But uh, anyway, back to the TZ here. Uh, the trademarks include a TZ450E and a TZ550E. Um, so based on the RZ trim strategy that we know currently with the current vehicle, um, the 450 version has 308 horsepower. That would be fine, I'm sure, for a three-row, you know, electric crossover. So that'll be the 450 version, almost certainly. With the 550e version, maybe jumping to 400 horsepower. If they maybe do, you know, two of those powerful motors, uh, you know, combined. Um, I believe 400 horsepower is where this e force powertrain maxed out at, based on what they hinted at uh, several years ago when they were developing this whole platform. Um, so that would be my guess is 550 does, you know, 400 horsepower, but we'll have to wait and see about all that. It might have a little bit of a wait still for these um, with uh, previous Toyota plans revealing the factory won't be building these until 2025. So uh, we still certainly have a little ways to go for that. Um, but we could still, you know, see a reveal next year, even if it's not ready to be built until 2025. So anyway, very interesting to hear that. A vehicle it seems like we'll never get here in the U.S., unfortunately, is the new Mitsubishi Triton um, that was revealed this week um, for other parts of the world. So for those that are curious, I'm not going to you know go on this too long because it's again something we're not we're not going to be getting but it gets diesel engines offers a manual transmission and even offers offers a single cab and extended cab versions uh, inside it gets a few nice touches though from the Nissan parts bin looks like it has a nice interior with the quilting on the seats there and you know nice infotainment so I mean still really nice truck that I think would sell really well in the states if they chose to offer it here. Um, it, the problem is, of course, they'd have to find some place in North America to build it to get around the chicken tax that's keeping all those foreign trucks out of you know the U.S. market. But um, even if they could find a place to build it, though, I mean, you have so many established players. We have the new Tacoma coming. It'll also be offering a manual and an extended cab version. So that'll fill that niche for those people that want that. And Tacoma versus Mitsubishi, I feel like everyone's going to go for the Tacoma, basically, you know, unless the Mitsubishi would be way cheaper. So, you know, even though it's like, oh, they're not bringing this here to the States, I don't blame them for not bringing it to the States. They'd really have to undercut aggressively, um, you know, to, to make any kind of dent, I think, even if they were able to bring it. So anyway, the, interesting to see that. And I'm sure, you know, for those markets that don't get all the other American stuff, I'm sure, you know, it'll be still a pretty solid seller. And for the last news story here this week, seven car companies this week announced a joint partnership uh, to launch a new charging network um, that will have over 30,000 new chargers with both CCS and NACS uh, plugs. And while the new chargers uh, will be open to all EVs, the companies involved will be able to be closely involved with the development of these chargers to make sure that they work seamlessly with those companies. So that's the advantage of being in this partnership is you know, they're able to hopefully all the vehicles from these brands charging on these chargers will have a seamless Tesla-like experience. I think that's kind of the idea here. That's what a lot of these companies have been really wanting and demanding, and they've been obviously lacking with all the current you know charging networks out there. So the companies involved here uh, are GM, Honda, Hyundai, Kia, Mercedes, BMW, and Stellantis brands. Um, so aside from GM and Mercedes, all those other companies haven't announced a Tesla partnership yet for the NACS plug switchover and the supercharger network. 
So it'll be interesting to see, are these companies going to hold out and not do that switch since these chargers will all have CCS as well, or are they still going to join the bandwagon and all go to the NACS uh, ports as well? We will have to wait and see. You know, Time will tell what com you know what these companies announce. Um, but surprisingly, this week we do not have a car company announcing a switch to NACS. This is the first week in probably two months <laughs> we haven't had one of those announcements. But um, so we'll see. Uh, anyway, the getting back to the charging network, they're planning to use plug and charge tech to, again, help make it really seamless, hopefully. Um, they say the first stations will be built near big cities and transit hubs, um, with the later stations coming to busy highways and frequent vacation spots and things like that. Um, and, you know, well, having more chargers anywhere is always great. It's great to have more options in case, you know, you have ones that go down or just a lot of demand. This is great to see, but again, it's all they're all focused in the same areas, which I understand, again, you wanna make sure you have that really well covered, but all the people that are doing cross country road trips or doing some type of stuff in the middle of flyover states are still you know going to be out of luck unless they're using tesla supercharger stations which aren't perfect either with their coverage but are a lot better but you know no one's focusing on the actual gaps it seems like everyone just wants to heavily blanket the established stuff that's already pretty well covered i would say in my opinion um and so you know we will see about you know how this uh, strategy works out for them but i think it's going to really continue to alienate people who need more chargers the most uh, to be honest but anyway um lastly they say that these chargers um won't just be chargers and they'll be full-blown stations that have a bunch of other amenities so they say they'll have canopies wherever possible and amenities such as restrooms food service and retail operations either nearby or within the same complex and they also added that the electricity will be sourced 100 percent from renewable sources so i believe that's the same as like evgo where you know they they try and yeah have it from 100 percent renewable and uh, you know try and you know do that in a carbon neutral way so the first ones will be arriving in the summer of 2024 and they're coming to both the u.s and canada so um great to hear this news though again lots and lots of stuff i mean mercedes has their own charging network then they're partnering up with this one and then you have you know all these other companies that are doing new charging networks where you're going to have you know everyone expanding more superchargers i mean it's it's this is really the explosion and the investment that we've all been you know expecting and hoping for if we're going to actually do this transition to evs and it seems like you know the money is really coming in and we're gonna have tons of charging stations here um you know in the next couple of years and uh with thirty thousand here plus you have what thirty thousand with tesla and there's like twelve thousand of the other chargers out there i mean we're going to be getting close to you know hundred thousand chargers here probably when it's all said and done so i mean it's and we're only talking about the next few years um so i think that uh, hopefully charging will get a lot better here really quickly in the next year or two so Great to hear that. And lastly, I want to thank all of you that are members of the Matt Moran Motoring Club. So we didn't have any new members join this week. We had a lot of people that were able to rejoin. Some rejoined on their own, and uh, many others also were able to rejoin thanks to Jeremy Wang's very generous uh, gifts uh, during the live stream. Um, so many thanks, Jeremy, for that huge shout out to you for helping more people to rejoin here and um for anyone else that would like to join and become a member there's always join buttons here on the uh, video page on the channel page and a link in the description but i really appreciate all the support from all of you um that are members and uh, also want to give one last thanks again to factor for sponsoring this video uh show them some love if that's something that interests you as well but anyway thank you all very much for watching please leave a like and subscribe to keep these videos coming and i'll see you guys in the next one take care